We have been uh, studying on Sunday mornings what I've been calling, at least, Moments in Mark. And in the book of Mark, the little gospel of Mark, just 16 chapters, uh, we, see how, we have studied and we've seen these life-changing and powerful moments. In the last couple of weeks, we've studied as uh, a blind man can see, as a lame man can walk, uh, as dead people are given life once again. Uh, Jesus is healing and teaching and crowds of people are following him wherever he goes. We've noted a couple of times, and we should remember that 40 times in this little book, the shortest of the Gospels, 40 times Mark uses the word immediately, which clues us in to the, the powerful impact of the Gospel and of the ministry of Jesus. But not every change that happens in this book, not every change that we see in this book, in Mark's Gospel account, happened immediately. If you and I as Christians today only expect spiritual changes to happen in our lives in an instant, in a powerful moment, when we hear, you know, the perfect sermon visiting some other congregation or something along those lines, when we, when we uh, uh, watch something online that just, you know, knocks our socks off or see the greatest meme that has ever been written or open our Bible and find the perfect passage of Scripture uh, that we needed on that day, if we expect that that's how spiritual change is going to happen... I think we're going to be disappointed. If you and I are expecting and waiting for those sort of moments in our spiritual life, when everything changes, when we are overwhelmed by the gospel, when we uh, finally let God's word take hold in our life and we become some sort of super Christian, we need to know this morning that that's not how the gospel works. That's not how spiritual things work. This morning I want us to think about changes that happened in the lives of men who were never blind and in the lives of men who were never lame or paralyzed, who were never raised from the dead. I want us to think about changes in the book of Mark that happened over uh, years of time. And specifically, I want us to look at the life of Peter. In just a couple of weeks, it's actually three weeks, I checked when uh, Rick did the announcements because I got real nervous. But uh, unless I looked incorrectly, we have three weeks till Bible class starts, three Sundays from today. And if I'm wrong, I'm really sorry, I just messed everything up. But three weeks, and then two weeks after that, uh, we have our Vacation Bible School. We didn't have Vacation Bible School last year for obvious reasons, but we held that curriculum, and this year we're going to start again. And our VBS this year focuses on the life of Peter. When we think about Peter, we think about someone who is so bold in their faith, and that's really where the VBS takes us. He was willing to act, he was willing to speak, he was willing to repent, and so on. As we think about his life this morning, and as we think about the changes that took place in his life this morning, as we think about the powerful impact of God and of Jesus and of the Word of God on the life of Peter, consider first that Peter's life changed. Peter's life changed in a powerful way long before he ever met Jesus. You say, well, what in the world are you talking about? Peter's life changed in a powerful way long before he ever met Jesus. In fact, of all the people that we have studied, most of these events in Mark, most of these moments, these unforgettable, powerful moments in the lives of these people, when they came in contact with Jesus, when everything changed, when nothing would ever be the same again, most of these people were greatly influenced by God long before they met Jesus. We don't know everything about Peter's past or his upbringing or his personal life or his, his family, but we do know a few things. We know that Peter's father was named either John or Jonah, depending on the translation that you look at and the manuscripts you look at. In John chapter 1 and verse 42, Jesus says to Peter, you are Simon the son of Jonah or Simon the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Before he was known as Peter, before Jesus gave him that name, he was known as Simon, and his father's name was Jonah. We know that his brother was Andrew, and it was Andrew, the brother of Peter, who first told him about Jesus being the Messiah. We'll talk a little bit about that more in a minute. We know that Peter was married in Mark chapter 1. Uh, one of the first things we see in that book is that Jesus heals the mother-in-law, the mother of Peter's wife, uh, of her illness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul writes about taking along a believing wife like Cephas or like Peter did as Paul travels on his missionary journeys. 
We also know that Peter was a fisherman. He was from a family of fishermen. And we know, of course, as obvious as it may sound, we know that Peter was Jewish. And he wasn't just Jewish. It seems that Peter was faithfully and devoutly Jewish. In Acts chapter 10, that sheet is lowered down in a vision before Peter, you may recall. And there are all sorts of unclean animals on that sheet. And a voice from heaven speaks to him and says, Get up, Peter. Arise, kill, and eat. It tells Peter, or God is trying to tell Peter, about the Gentiles. Now they are no longer unclean. You should preach the gospel to them as well. Arise, Peter. Get up and kill and eat. But we remember Peter's response was, I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. Through his entire life, Peter says, I've never eaten anything That goes against the law of Moses. I've never eaten anything that the Old Testament describes as unclean. And that reminds us that Peter is not just Jewish, but of course he was Jewish by birth. Peter grew up in a Jewish home. Peter had Jewish parents. He would have studied the law of Moses. He knew what God's word said. Peter had life-changing moments because of God long before he met Jesus. Because he studied God's word. Because God's word was practiced in his home. Because God's instructions were important in the life of Peter and in the the family that Peter grew up in. Peter's life was changed. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Moses instructs the Israelites after they've come out of the land of Egypt and as they're in that wilderness, Moses instructs those people, here is how you stay faithful to God. Here is what you need to do. In order to remain faithful to God. Here is how you you keep your family faithful to God. Here is how you'll ultimately be blessed by God. Entering into that promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 beginning in verse 4. Moses writes. God instructs Moses to write. Hear O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart. With all your soul. With all your might. These words which I am commanding you today. Shall be on your heart. Moses tells the people. As he tells them how to be faithful. God is our God. God is one God. God is the only God. Love him with everything that you possibly can. Keep these words on your heart. Moses is telling those people, God needs to be the center of your life. God's word needs to be the center of your homes. He needs to be the center of your family. In verse 7, he says, You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. At every moment of every day, in every circumstance you find yourself, remember, recall, speak of God's perfect word. His word needs to be the center of your life. That's how important it is. But again, it's not just for you. It's for your children. In verse 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, he continues, You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. When you leave your home, see God's word there. When you come back to your house, see God's word there on the door. And if Peter grew up like most Jewish children grew up, and if his family followed the law of Moses and did what they were supposed to according to the words that Moses wrote down, then on the door of Peter's home, on the doorpost of Peter's home, there would have been those words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And that passage would continue. Peter would have known that scripture by heart among so many others. The word of God would have been at the center of that home and the center of his life. Nothing would have been more important to Peter and to Peter's family. And so because of that, Peter and his brother were looking for, they were waiting for the Messiah. They were looking for and waiting for the anointed of God. They had read about the Messiah coming. They had heard about the Messiah coming all of their life. And now they are waiting for this king to come who in their minds is going to rise up and lead Israel and kick the Romans right out of town. Peter knew that the Messiah was coming and he knew that because he knew the word of God. See, Peter's life was changed by God long before he ever met Jesus. In John chapter 1... Andrew, the brother of Peter, is following John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist sees as Jesus walks by. And he says, John the Baptist says to those disciples and maybe the crowd that is there, Behold the Lamb of God. He sees Jesus walk by and he declares, That is the Lamb of God. That is the offering of God. That is the one that God has sent. And Andrew then, after following John the Baptist, hears those words and decides, I'm going to follow that guy. I'm going to start following this one he calls the Lamb of God. And the text tells us that he followed Jesus and he spent the day with Jesus. And then the first thing that he does after that day is over, after hearing Jesus teach, is he goes out and he finds his brother Peter. In John chapter 1 and verse 41, we read that he found first his own brother Simon and he said to him, We have found the Messiah. He finds his brother after spending that day with Jesus and he says, We found him. We found the one that we have been looking for. The search is over. The anointed, the Messiah, the one sent by God. We have found what we've been looking for, what we've been waiting for all of these years. You think, how could that conversation, how could those words make any sense to Peter? If you came up to me today and said, we found him, we found him. We've been looking for him all this time. I wouldn't know what you were talking about because we're not looking for anything. But to Peter and Andrew, it made perfect sense because they knew the word of God. Because they knew What God had promised. Because they knew what they were looking for. I wonder how we can expect our children to search for God. How we can expect our children to look for Christ. I wonder how we can expect our children to remain faithful to God if the word of God is not at the center of our homes. If the word of God is not at the center of our marriages. If the word of God is not at the center of our families, how can we expect our children, and I'm not sure that we do, how can we expect our children to remain faithful to God and to seek out Jesus and to strive to follow his word if the word of God is not at the center of this congregation and of the church that we show them and of our Bible studies and of our sermons and of our lives? How can we expect them to seek out Jesus to seek out the truth of God's word if they don't know the importance of God's word. If they don't see the power in God's word. If we don't tell them or they don't know of the promises in God's word. Peter's life was changed. Peter's life was greatly influenced long before he ever met Jesus. Second, we see that Peter's life was changed while he was just a fisherman. Peter's life was changed while he was still just a fisherman. When we think about Peter, at least when I think about him, I think about the incredible things that happened in his life. It is Peter who stepped out of the boat and walked on water like Jesus walked on water. It was Peter who denied Jesus those three times and then heard that rooster crow. It was Peter who preached the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was Peter who preached the first gospel sermon to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. But the days before Peter met Jesus, I imagine were much like every other day. The days before he encountered Jesus, before Andrew told him about Jesus, before he saw Jesus and began to follow him, I imagine those days were like every other. He was a normal guy who had a normal job. He was a a fisherman in a family of fishermen. And the days before he met Jesus were like every other day, working on that boat and, and mending the nets of that boat and casting those nets into the sea. I imagine he would pull those nets in and try to catch as many fish as he could because that was his job. That was his livelihood. He was Simon the fisherman doing what he has done most every day of his life. But in Mark chapter 1, something incredible happens. An incredible change takes place in Mark chapter 1 beginning in verse 16. Speaking of Jesus, the text tells us as he was going along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. That's when it started. That's when it began. That's when he started to follow Jesus. That's when Peter's life takes this incredible turn. Maybe he grew up like every other little Jewish boy. Maybe on the Sea of Galilee that day, he looked like hundreds of other fishermen to you and I if we were there. But the moment that Jesus said, follow me, his life took a turn. 
His life changed forever. The text tells us that immediately, without any pause, without any hesitation, without any delay, Peter and Andrew, those two fishing brothers, left their nets behind and they began to follow Jesus. Now, why did they do that? Why did they follow Jesus on, on such a short invitation? We preach for 45 minutes. Uh, we don't. We preach for 30 minutes, 25 minutes, and we invite people to come. And we try to get people to, to, to feel God's word uh, pierce their heart. And here Jesus just says a few words. And these two men leave everything behind and follow. Why do they do that? Nothing miraculous happened. There was no lifelong illness or disease that he healed them of. Why did they follow Jesus? They followed Jesus because they knew the word of God. They believed that he could be the one. They knew that he was the Messiah. We have found him. We have found the Christ. Scripture was fresh in their minds and it was on their hearts. And because Jesus not only asked them to follow, he told them that they could become something great. Not just fishermen, but fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. Jesus is saying to these two brothers, I'm going to change your life. I'm going to change everything about you. I'm going to make you something different, something better, something more important, greatly more important than you are right now, something that you don't yet fully understand. Jesus not only called these men, Jesus gave them hope. It's a moment in the life of Peter among so many other moments that would change who he was forever. And it happened because he knew the word of God, because he heard the words of Jesus, because he was willing to leave everything else behind and follow him. Peter's life changed long before he met Jesus. Peter's life changed while he was just a fisherman on that boat and he left those nets behind. And Peter's life continued to change every day, I imagine, for three and a half years. For three and a half years, for the entire ministry of God's Son on this earth, Peter's life would change. He heard all of the teachings of Jesus. He was there. He may have seen the majority, if not all, of the miracles that Jesus performed. He was there. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus raised that little girl from the dead back into life. Peter was in the room. In Mark chapter 9, Peter was there when Jesus was transfigured, when he changed before their very eyes. When Elijah and Moses both appeared, when God's voice spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, listen to him. Peter heard that voice. Peter was there. In Mark chapter 14, when they arrested Jesus, and when they take him to the courtyard of the high priest and begin that trial, the text tells us that Peter followed at a distance and he watched as those events unfolded, warming his hands by the fire. Peter was there. And when the tomb was found empty by those ladies on Sunday morning, when they ran back to let the disciples know, Peter and John ran as fast as they could to that tomb. John was kind enough to record for us that, that he beat Peter in that race. He made it there first. John gets to the tomb. He looks inside and he sees the body is not there. Peter gets there. He doesn't look inside. He jumps right in. He stands inside that empty tomb. He sees the linens over there. He sees the cloth that covered his face over there. He's standing there. He knows for certainty that that tomb is empty. For Peter, those three and a half years of the ministry of Jesus were filled with powerful and unforgettable and life-changing moments. We know that his faith had good days and bad days. At times, he was incredibly bold, and at other times, he was incredibly scared. But it wasn't just one powerful moment that changed his life. It was a lifetime of moments. You see, throughout the book of Mark, we've seen these moments. We've talked about them. We've thought about these moments and times when people's lives are dramatically changed and changed forever. When they have this incredible encounter with the Son of God and they, they are there with God in the flesh and they experience something that they could never possibly forget. But when we look at the life of Peter, a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, a man who didn't need a miraculous healing, I think we see someone who could be just like any one of us. A kid who grew up studying the Word of God in his house. A child who grew up with the word of God at the center of his life. A fisherman, 
who was like every other man on that sea, who heard Jesus call, who decided to leave everything behind and follow him. When we think about Peter, when we look at Peter, we see a disciple whose faith and whose trust in God had some good days, had some bad days, who knew for a fact how powerful Jesus was and who had no question, no doubt that this was in fact the Son of God. When we think about Peter, I think we see something in someone that all of us can be. People who hear the word of God. People who believe the word of God. People who answer the call to follow Jesus. People who witness the power of Jesus demonstrated in the pages of scripture over and over again. People whose faith and whose trust in God might have great days where we feel like we are on top of the world and cannot be touched by sin. And then we have those other days when maybe our faith is a little weaker. People whose lives are changed, not in some miraculous, powerful moment that will never be forgotten, but over a lifetime of faithful living. People who see hope in Jesus. Even though Peter was there, as Jesus healed and fed and taught thousands of people, and even though Peter was there literally standing inside that empty tomb, I don't think Peter believed any more than I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't think Peter believed any more than I believe that Jesus rose from that grave on the third day. We have everything that we need to know everything that Peter knew. See, don't wait for some powerful, miraculous, life-changing moment in your life. Make God's Word the center of your life today. Make God's word the center of your home. Make God's word the center of your marriage. Allow God's word to change you, powerfully change who you are and how you live your life. Not just to change, though, your physical life, but to change your eternal life as well. This morning we offer the invitation to anyone who might need to respond. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we invite you to do that today. We invite you to make that change in your life. The Bible teaches that if you hear the word of God and you believe it, if you are willing to repent of sin in your life and confess the name of Jesus before men, confess that you believe all of the same things that Peter believes, you can go down into the waters of baptism and have your sins washed away. There is not a more powerful moment that could ever take place. If you haven't done that, we'd invite you to do that today. Maybe you have been baptized, but you have sin in your life. Maybe that sin is public in nature and would demand a public repentance. If that's the case, we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We don't want you to leave here carrying that burden of sin and separation from God. Maybe you just need the prayers of this congregation while we're gathered here to get today for encouragement or for some other reason. Whatever your need might be, we invite you to come. Make it known while together we stand while we sing this invitation song.